Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 98. Wow, 98. We need to uh-huh. we need to plan something special for 100, Chris. We, we kind of do. Or 99, right? Because that's kind of like the eve before the Y2K. That's oh, true. Well, 99 is going to be special. I'm not going to say why, but we have a pretty awesome guest coming up on 99, as we do on 98. But uh, I wait, 100 is a big deal. I never thought I'd make it to the to the triple digits. That doesn't sound very confident, Chris. <laughs> should we should we delve into why you didn't think you would make it to the triple digits? Do you think it wasn't going to last this long, <laughs> or, or or were you going to go to jail for killing Dave for playing? Well, that that was always a possibility. But I just started this as like a hobby. You know, we were just doing this for fun. I didn't I didn't actually think it would turn into uh, something that we would a hundred months. That's eight. That's almost eight and a half, what eight and a half years. I feel old. Almost a decade. Almost a decade. <laughs> Almost. Now, this month, though, is is a is a pretty cool podcast because every year um, the the SE Village at, at DEF CON continues to grow. Uh, there's a lot of people who come. Uh, we've been told again this year, which is just really fascinating. They come out all the way from wherever they're from to DEF CON just to sit in the SE Village for, for three days. And uh, we had a lot of people that that ask, like, you think I could ever do that? You think I could ever get in the booth and and be part of the SECTF? So this year we had two people uh, that we wanted to invite onto the podcast because Chris Kirsch, our first place winner from uh, from the SECTF this year, he competed uh, before in in the in the competition and he did really bad. And then this year, he fixed all of that and came back and obviously did amazing because he won. But I really wanted to talk about that. And then our second place winner has been now second place two years in a row. She's a little bit crazy and scary, but she also has some amazing talent because here's a person who never even was at DEF CON ever. Her husband came into the SE Village three years ago, called her and said, you have to come out here and see this thing that they're doing. This is up your alley. She literally got the plane, flew to Vegas, came into the village, and said, "Next year I'm competing," and has now competed since then. So we got to get these two people onto the podcast to to talk about their process and adventure from starting off all the way up to joining us and as winners of the SECTF. So we're going to get Rachel and Chris in the podcast now to join us with our lovely panel. You'll notice it's going to be horns be free today. Because Dave's not here, but we have the ever lovely Ping Look. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. You've been very consistent, by the way. Lately, way more consistent than Dave. Just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> and no need to stab him. He's not here to defend himself. <laughs> He's probably busy, though. He's probably on the road doing something exciting. He will, you know what? He might be in Florida and call in. No. <laughs> and say that he has survived the hurricane. You know, you know, if it, I wouldn't be surprised if Dave actually was like on a hurricane plane calling in or something from the actual eye of Irma. That, that, would, that, that actually would not surprise me if Dave did that at any point in time in the near future. And we also have Michelle, who never misses a podcast ever. That's because I'm paid to be here. Oh, oh really? <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> now, I thought, I, I thought you did it because you loved it. That that hurts a little bit. Just wanna, I just want to say. The truth comes out. That, that hurts. That hurts. The truth on the Social Engineering Podcast. That's right. Well, you know what? She's being honest now. So, you know, clear conscience that she doesn't have to, you know, follow up with another story if she doesn't tell the truth. That's true. It's it's always if you're gonna lie, you have to remember this stuff. So don't, you know. don't defend the pain. Don't defend the pain. Okay? It just hurts. So while I go weep, we're gonna get our two guests onto the podcast. We are back with our guests, Chris and Rachel. Nice to have you on the show today. Thanks Woo. for having us. I'm really excited about this one because um, every year we get a lot of questions about what kind of people make up the winners of the SECTF. And I think that those who've never competed always assume it's folks who do this for a living and have, you know, just sit on the phone all day and the SE people, then they get in the booth and they just naturally win because they do that. So let's be chivalrous and say, Rachel, can you tell us what is it that you do for work? 
Yeah, it has nothing to do with social engineering. I do user research and I'm a former teacher. So I used to teach special needs. And now I just casually help 200 million students at Course Hero. So it's like teaching on a larger scale, but definitely not social engineering. Casually help 200 million students. Yes. Okay. I don't know if you do anything casually. (laughs) You're the scariest candidate we've ever had. I just want you to know that, by the way. That makes me so happy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But you have to define why it was so scary, Chris. Okay. Okay. So the first year Rachel ever competed, she sent her video in. Honestly, the only thing I can ever compare this to was some really, really bad drug trip mixed with like skinny puppy industrial music. And at this point, we didn't even know her. I didn't know who she was, right? So I get this video and honestly, I can't even describe it with reality, but it's like if you ever listened to industrial music back in the late 80s, early 90s, it was like a skinny puppy video. There was like screaming and machetes and people in (laughs) Halloween masks and then people jumping through her eyeballs and then her and a cat on the floor with heavy metal music. It was like New World Order. I was like, what the heck is going on? And we like, we have to put her in the booth because this can only go one of one way, which is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she and it did. It went amazing. So then she took second place last year. And then this year she competed. And I thought there's no way she can do a video that was any scarier than last year's. I mean, there's just no way because last year's was just a freak show. And it was worse. I mean, <laughs> worse isn't better. Worse isn't more scary. Like I watched it. It was one in the morning. I actually like went to look out the window to make sure she wasn't standing out there. <laughs> you know what? I saw you do that. You couldn't see that as well when I saw you do that. So how many hours, Rachel, did you spend learning Michelle and I's body language and vocal tone so you can mimic us at that one part of the video? You know what? Honestly, it probably took about 30 minutes. I recorded you guys on Snapchat. And you know how Snapchat is a loop. I would just loop you saying to be mitigating on and mitigate human-based attacks over and over. And we just recorded it at night and it was fantastic. So your tradecraft is fantastic because you've got some OCD going on. <laughs> <laughs> you were yes. trying your hardest to make a nice... <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. In the right way, right? You're focused in a healthy way. I would say usually fully healthy, but when the SECTF comes around, I would say I might venture into the realm of extreme in that I can't go to bed because I'm so excited and I can't stop looking at Instagram. So you've got a terrier in you. Yeah, my bull terrier is exactly the way you are. When she is hyper-focused, yes. she's going to sit there and stare at that molehill oh, yeah. for hours. <laughs> Hour. I and then she submits a laser. report that's like 60 pages. Wow. So now let's jump to the opposite side, the non-crazy calming, <laughs> soothing. calming side, soothing. Like his video was a mimic of the opening take for the show Lie to Me. And he did amazing. And it was really uh, just as good quality as Rachel. But you can watch it with your family and you feel happy when you're done. <laughs> I don't look behind the couch and wait for, you know, I don't have like a knitting needle that I need to like stab someone with. I'm not so scared. Basically, it was Yoda versus Darth Vader. Yes. The emperor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The emperor. Definitely the emperor. Yeah. And, uh, I, I do feel I have to take some lessons from Rachel, though. No, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, you, you can't compete anymore because you took first place. So okay. there are no more lessons. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. But it, it's sort of like the Highlander, though. There should be only one, you know? That <laughs> yes. <is>. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because if there's two, then I don't know what we do with that. You know, I, I don't know. But Chris, now, what do you do for a living? The fact that you took first place in this. Yeah. So I also don't work as a social engineer. I work in marketing. I've been working in marketing for security for about 20 years. Um, Right now I'm with Veracode. I have had a lot of exposure to pen testers. I used to work on uh, on the Metasploit product in my previous job. And so I hung out a lot with them and asked them for stories over beers and so on. And that's always a lot of fun. So I, I have a little bit of inside baseball, but I've never really done it myself. So, and this is what's amazing to me. We got two people here. The difference, the gap in score from the first two places to the next place down was huge. And neither of you guys are professional social engineers for a living. That's correct. Which just kind of, I think, should be encouraging. We've had professionals and people that do it for a living come in. We had multiple pen testers that actually, they say that they've done this for part of their work. But I will tell you that In the majority of the years, this is our eighth year now, 
And the majority of the years that we've done this competition, it's always the noobs who win as opposed to the professionals. And if you look at past reports, a lot of the predictors of success are things like preparation and just time spent, you know, doing OSINT. So like obviously Chris and Rachel spent a lot of time looking at their targets and coming up with good pretexts and coming up with ways to deal with objections. So it's not necessarily experience, but it's just preparation and effort in my mind. Chris, how much time did you spend? I didn't really track it. I think it was about 40 to 60 hours. So I had about three weeks from when you gave the target to the deadline. And I spent most of my weekends during that time on the report and a little bit of time during the week. How about you, Rachel? How much time did you spend? I would say nothing short of 100 hours. <laughs> <laughs> what? Thorough. No, that's that's legit, right? Because if this was a real engagement, it would probably be two full weeks. In the real world, that's what we do. But I mean, this is for a, a competition that you don't get paid for. You actually spend your but money. it's meaningful. To come and do this. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. It's a meaningful goal. It's like exercising, right? And Chris gave up all his free time. <laughs> you have no life now, right? <laughs> no, it's different from exercising, though, because you get completely obsessed and you want to do nothing else. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Well, the way I see it is like I read a book called uh, The Road to Sparta, and it's about these ultra marathoners. And so you both ran the ultra marathon for social engineering. It's true. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> for it. By the end of it, you're so enamored with your target company. You feel like you're a therapist who's like getting involved in your people's lives. <laughs> like, I feel like, like I know them personally. <laughs> oh, Rachel, I love you. I, really do. I don't know, Chris, did you feel the same way? Did you feel that intimately? Not enamored, involved? but I think I actually know my target company better than my own company right now. It is kind of scary. <laughs> you, you find out the weirdest things because you just research for hours and hours and you just come up against weird details that you'd never otherwise know. So I actually kind of want to randomly meet somebody from my target company and you know, have a chat with them about you know what, what's good at their cafeteria and stuff. You know, Insinuate <laughs> yourself into their lives, start dressing like them. It's, it's single white female all over again. <laughs> I can see Rachel actually doing that. I could see Rachel going to work, fake work at, at her target company. Absolutely. Just like moving in. I'd be like, Catherine, <laughs> how are you? Oh my gosh, so fun <laughs> talking with you last week. So fun. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So we have like 40 to 60 hours, 100 hours in OSINT. And I think what Michelle said for the years that we've been doing this competition, she's 100% correct that the more OSINT time that we see a, a contestant put into the CTF, they always do better on the calls. A lot of times people who are experienced, we found, try to rely too much on the calls. Like they send in a five page report, they didn't spend much time and they're like, well, I'm just going to get in the booth and wing it and, and do an amazing job and get all the points. But what they don't realize is how hard that catch up is when you have someone like Chris and Rachel who got almost every flag just in the reports. So they have a ton of points starting out, which is amazing. So you have all that time spent in OSINT how do you go about developing your pretext that you want to use on the actual calls? Because, you know, we have a, some rule basis for the competition. You know, you, you can't use a pretext that's going to be damaging or hurt the target. You can't use threats. You can't use any emergency type of situation. You're not allowed to talk about attacks or breaches. So you have some rules that you have to follow. You know, Rachel, how did you come up with your with your pretext that you wanted to use on the call? I start, before I come up with my pretext, I like to start and think about who my target's going to be because you can't just come up with a pretext willy-nilly. So the way that I find my targets is simply I need a number to call. If your number is going to be listed somewhere, I'm going to give you a call and see if you pick up because you're allowed to do that right in the SECTF, but you can't talk to them. So calling, I'd say 300 numbers, I mean like war dialing, but like manually, as many numbers as you possibly can and seeing who picks up and marking that down. And sometimes you'll hear numbers from their voicemail. You know, I'm not here right now, but if you have an emergency, call this number. So then I call that number and then they pick that up at any time of day. It's <laughs> terrible. I know. No, I don't call them at 3 a.m. That'd be so mean. I call them at my exact target time. So I call them on Saturdays when they're having brunch with their family. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't create a pretext until I know who my target's going to be. So that's what I do. Uh -huh. I had six to 20 people who picked up. So I developed six different pretexts that I could use in those situations. That's phenomenal. Chris, how do you do it? 
So similar process. I look at the OSINT first. I try to find as many flags as I can. And as part of that, I learn more and more about the company and I get a sense for what my play might be. So for example, this company was a gaming company and I figured out, okay, I could do something around that. So one of my pretexts, which I didn't actually use on the call, was to say, hey, I need a demo laptop for a conference. And I found out that there's this big gaming conference in Cologne like a couple of weeks later. So that was my pretext. And you only know that once you research the company. And then I was looking for numbers. So sometimes I start with the numbers. Sometimes I have an idea and look for numbers. When I look for numbers, last year I participated in the SCCTF and I got nobody on the phone because I was trying to target individuals. And it was on a Saturday. And then this year I said, all right, I'm not going to do that again. So I wanted to target this time I picked stores, retail stores, because I knew somebody was going to pick up. I don't know who, but somebody's going to pick up. So there are some people that will say, oh, I only found like two numbers. And they come in with basically two numbers that they're going to try to fill up 20 minutes with. How many phone numbers did the two of you have prepared to call? I had 35. I know the year before, I think I had 20 or 22. And we got through all of them twice and didn't get anybody on the phone. And that really burned me. And this year, I think I had about 30 maybe. So it wasn't like a huge number, but I only picked numbers where, you know, that were hotlines, IT hotlines, consumer hotlines, security hotline. That was kind of my Hail Mary one. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great point, right? Because I mean, we really, if, um, if you recall this year, we had a couple folks that just, they literally ran out of numbers and, and we had the audience kind of jumping in and trying to trying to help. Now, some of that is based on what's available online, but some of that is is clearly preparation. Yeah. One thing that actually helped a ton from the previous year to this year was that we were able to vet the numbers at the time of calling because I spent a solid Saturday trying out all the numbers I had found and trying them out and I crossed off most of them. And also one thing that helped is we were allowed to listen to numbers in the, I think it's called the IDR, for sales, press one, those kind of things. I went through all of the entire voice tree in my target company and found a few more numbers to call and tried those and so on. So you just got to keep on digging. After you do your OSINT and after you develop your pretext, now it comes time to show up at DEF CON. And this is always the part where, you know, people will ask about how hard this next part is. So I think getting it from people who have competed multiple years, as both of you have, this will be an interesting take. You're there, you look at the audience, you see the booth, you've been in it before. How nerve wracking, though, is it to get up and get into that last booth? I would say it's probably just about the scariest thing you could possibly do. You're looking out into a sea of 450 people. The audience, it's a kind audience. They want you to succeed. But at the very same time, they're interested to see what will happen if you fail, right? They don't think you're going to fail. But if it does, it's going to be interesting either way. And so it's a group of hackers that are, they're going to laugh when things happen. They're going to scream and clap after you hang up from the call. So it's the most exciting thing that you'll ever do. And also probably the most nerve wracking thing you'll ever do in your life. How about you, Chris? So of course, I was completely terrified. But at the same time, I know that DEF CON is such a good audience and everybody's in your corner. And the first year, you know, I did so badly the first year that I thought the second year, okay, now I don't have any dignity left. I can't get any worse. <laughs> There's nothing to lose at this point. <laughs> right. So do you think that the first year you kind of psyched yourself out because you were kind of like, everyone's watching me and hearing me and seeing yeah. me and I've got to really do this. And this year you're like, all right. I've made all of my mistakes and you came in with like this, I can only win from here, right? Like how much further could you go down? Exactly. (laughs) And I binged watched the entire first day of calls. I was a little bit obsessive, kind of like trying to see what are things that I should try to avoid? What are things that work well? Are there any rules that I might have overread, you know? So for example, I only realized on the day that you had a new rule that you aren't supposed to phone personal cell phones anymore. Is that right? Yeah, unless we know it's owned by the company, we don't want to call their personal. I only had one cell phone number on there and I decided, okay, I'm going to take that off. But, you know, those like last minute learnings. And then once I actually got in the up in the booth, I was fine. I had my baseball cap on and I looked down on my piece of paper so I couldn't actually see the audience. (laughs) Chris, as as I recall, too, you had like everything color coded and categorized. I mean, you were probably the most organized contestant we've we've ever seen. I'm a different kind of OCD from <laughs> Rachel, but yeah, still. 
Yeah, your lists were they were, were out of ridiculous. control. Chris, we'll start with you. Did you do anything special to prepare to get in the booth? So you know what your time's about to come. You know you're 30 minutes away from having to get in there. Was there anything that you did special to get yourself ready? I did a little bit of power posing, but one thing that actually really helps me, also I do this before presentations in a big room, is to get up either on stage or near the stage and look at the room from the perspective that I'm going to be seeing. Because that way, when I look up, it's not the kind of like moment where I see it for the first time, but I'm like, okay, I've seen this before. This is what I expected. And so that helps me a ton. And Rachel, what do you do to prepare? Talk to myself <laughs> for hours on end. Yeah, but that's not any different than any other day, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Except for this time, it's with purpose. This time, it's with purpose. I'm reading the script, like I'm saying my script until I have it memorized pretty much. And then I'm responding to myself like the other person. So I sound pretty nuts. (laughs) No, no, I can't imagine. (laughs) I was sitting on the ground or sitting on the bench outside of SE Village um, that Friday and people kept coming over to me being like, how you doing? You all right? You're talking to yourself. (laughs) I'm like, I'm cool. Yeah, I got it covered. Yeah. And you're like, no, you don't. Yes, you do. Yeah, no, you don't. yeah, exactly. What would you think is the biggest learning lesson for both of you from SECTF? Like, what is it that you learned the most? For me, it's that you need to start doing things before you are ready. If you wait until you're ready, if you wait until you know how things work or you understand the ins and outs, you're just going to miss your time. If I hadn't started last year and psyched myself out, I would have never gotten to the experience of where I am today, where I get to empower other women to start before they're ready on other things in security and privacy. You just got to jump in. Awesome. Chris? For me, I don't know. It's tough. I really enjoyed the experience. I always wanted to kind of figure out something to go up on stage at DEF CON. I'm not all that technical, so a lot of the other contests or you know even talks would be pretty tough for me to do. But I thought social engineering is something that I've always been excited about and interested in, and I, and I watched all the competitions previous years, so I thought, okay, I'll try and do that. And I wasn't quite sure how far I'd get, but I was just in it for the ride. So, Rejo, you're doing something pretty fascinating. I think you did your first one last year, but you're holding a pre-DEF CON how to prepare for DEF CON class. Yeah. So after my first time doing SECTF, as soon as I got off the stage, these amazing women came up to me and they were like, hi, our names are blah, 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 blah. And we're from Women in Security and Privacy. And do you want to join our board? And I was like, I don't know uh, if you don't know this, but I'm not in security and privacy. I duped all of (laughs) y'all. And they were like, no, please join anyway. So I guess now I am in security and privacy. I'm on the board. I'm the creative director at WISP. And I help lead this DEF CON prep series along with my other board members and volunteers. And we do different types of prep series. So I did an SECTF prep series. And Vince in the Bay actually attended to learn and and everything. And he was first SECTF this year. He went first in the booth, even though he had no experience and just learned what vishing was last year. We kind of talk about those things and we help them get prepared for CTFs as well. And do you plan on doing more of them? Absolutely. We're going to be doing more of that this year as well, because it's helped women a lot to get involved at DEF CON and they want to understand what they're getting themselves into, but they still need to jump in before they're ready. Yeah. It's just such an awesome idea to have you doing that and to have someone who's not in security, who came into it and be able to tell your experience, but help prepare both men and women for coming to DEF CON and, and what to expect and how to compete and all the different things that you that you teach at that class. I just think it's just a phenomenal thing to be doing. Pretty cool on your part. Thanks. Thanks for just letting me use your quotes over and over again on slides. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do it without that. <laughs> I don't know if I have a choice. I mean, considering now that you can just mirror me and almost and sound better. We should send you out to do a speech and just say you're Chris Hadnagy and see what people think. That's such a good idea. I'm in. Derby con. Actually, I was just thinking you should just say that it is a presentation you're doing and just completely rip off one that Chris was had done <laughs> and see if anyone notices. You should, that would be awesome. They're like, wait, Chris gave that talk, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> what would be even cooler is if they're like, man, Chris ripped off your talk. <laughs> I don't know how we did it, but he ripped off your talk. Yeah, I'm going you know? to sue you. 
Yeah, that would be so awesome. We should actually plan that. Okay. You give one of my speeches and then we see how many people actually remember it or if they just give you the credit for it. Once it's out on the internet, people may just be like, man, this guy just totally ripped off this poor woman's talk. Yeah. Rachel will probably backdate it on YouTube as well. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you're doing it. I can see you're doing it. So, Chris Kirsch, did your overlords at Barracode <laughs> Give you a special bonus? <laughs> no, <laughs> but <laughs> come on, someone in your company must have given you kudos for your achievement. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, they're actually very supportive. It's a company that really lives the hacker culture, so nobody looks at you strange when you do stuff like that, which is very cool. And if it's living the hacker culture, that means you're immersed in it. So, what do you consider the hacker culture there? Just out of curiosity. So first of all, technical curiosity. It doesn't always have to be security related. We actually have two hackathons a year where three days twice a year are put aside for just doing your own projects. And it can be whatever you want. Can be security related, can be technology related, can be something else. A lot of people, you know, try out different things. Last year, I actually did a OSINT course for our salespeople, which was kind of interesting. The year before, I was uh, looking at web shells and learning more about those, not strictly related to work, but maybe some angle for that. So it can be a lot of different things. There's some people who do just an escape the room kind of thing. So it's that joint learning and just experimenting and so on. It's kind of fun. That is kind of cool. Next one's coming up. There are some social engineering aspects of that. I'm going to be there. I'm going to take one of the badges from Barrett right now. I know. You'll just walk right in, right? <laughs> <laughs> I actually believe that. You know, that's the thing that scares me is I actually believe it. I fully expected someday to look out my window and see Rachel looking in. You know, I really do. Do you need badges to get into your house or? No, you're gonna soon because of your videos scare me that much. The problem is Rachel wouldn't watch through the window. She would just sit on your couch. Yes, I'd be. Yeah, there. that's right. <laughs> I'd be looking at her through my window. <laughs> <laughs> Please let me in my own house. Yeah. Take a quick break from the show, Michelle, to discuss what's going on in the world of SECOM. Well, we are rapidly coming down to the last few events, right, for the year. <laughs> we are. I mean, it's kind of nuts, right? So DerbyCon just ended. We finally – are we recovered from DEF CON yet, are we? There is no <laughs> yeah, recovery. When you're, you, once you start the summer con – through fall con, it's never ending because it's like Q3, Q4, plus all the cons. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, it's, it's, it, we recovered, but then I felt like, I don't know, are we recovered? Because I still feel tired. Recovery. Yeah, there's not. But um, on the website right now is our, is our APSE for February 5 through 9 of 2018. That class is half full. Actually, it's more than half full at this point. We are about 65% full looking at the numbers as of now. So um, if you're going to want to join that class, you can jump in there now. And as of right now today, I don't even know if I could say this because this is future today, but as of right now, we're going to we're gonna say it anyway. There's only one seat left in the MLSE. So if you were an invited APSE student, you may want to jump on that. There's only one seat left. There's more classes coming, of course. We're going to have one over in the UK. That date is not yet announced, so just keep checking the site. And that will be up there hopefully very soon. And uh, I can't think. I think that, that's, that's I like think it, that's right? that's it for now. I guess that's it. So back to the show. Now, Chris, we did, we did something cool. After you won the SECTF, you wanted to recreate the winning call as a learning experience for people so that maybe because we can't record the actual phone calls because it's in Nevada, which is a two party consent state. So we're not allowed to record any audio of the phone calls because then we're breaking federal wiretapping law. So we have no way of really showing people who can't make it to DEF CON what the SECTF looks like. So you had this great idea to recreate your winning call and you asked, hey, can we do this? And then I portrayed the poor guy who got hacked and you portrayed tim the guy from it 
and uh, tell us a little about how that went. <laughs> yeah. So that was fun. Yeah, basically... I had been looking online after my first DEF CON. I'd been looking online for any recordings of people doing social engineering. And there is not a ton out there. I mean, there are some prank calls and stuff like that, but it's not really all that great. So I wanted to bring this to a broader audience. I knew I had my side of the script from preparing all the OSINT and preparing the pretext. So together with Chris, we kind of pieced together the responses from the other side and then reenacted it. I think it actually came out pretty well. So if anybody in the audience is interested in watching that, I have a short URL here. It's vera.cd, so V-E-R-A dot C-D slash S-E-C-T-F. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That, that That's a flag, right? Go, getting someone to go to a suspicious <laughs> I, I know, URL. I know most of the people. <laughs> I know most of the people in the audience will never click on that and never enter that into their browser. Yeah. I'll actually get extra bonus points for everybody who types that in. Well, I know. Rachel, you go to the site first. Absolutely. Yeah, Rachel, <laughs> Rachel you go first. <laughs> Rachel, you're our canary. Go. Tell us what happens. Can you give the URL again because I rudely interrupted you? No worries. So it's V-E-R-A dot C-D. It's like shortened for Veracode. Then slash S-E-C-T-F, social engineering, capture the flag. All lowercase. I think it's case sensitive, the second part of the URL. Malicious links usually are. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What I love about your concept for this video, but one of the things that he wanted to make sure that we got across was that this video was not made in a way that made the target person look stupid. The design of the video wasn't like, look how dumb this guy is. He gave me all this info. That was not the design. It was, let's show how a person who doesn't do this for a living could get in and make up a pretext and then get every flag. And I think the real call was 11 minutes or 12 minutes total. Yeah, I think the live one was, in the room was 14. And I think on the video, it's about 10 or 12. Okay, so within 14 minutes, how you can obtain literally almost every flag on the list with an amazing pretext. And the video was done in a way that we're not like, haha, look at this guy. Second, I love the idea that you had of every time there's a flag, there's a ding and then a counter. So you're going to get to see those flags go up. I also just like the whole concept that it's a video. You're going to get a chance, those who haven't been, even though it's a staged call, that's about how realistic it went. Yeah. And we also have the information in there at the bottom of the screen why this flag could get you owned. Because sometimes when you ask for, hey, what courier service are you using? Are you using FedEx? You know, it's not obvious why that might put you at risk. And we have little explanations for people who might not be familiar with that. Yeah, so it's going to be a really big educational piece. I think if we blend something like that with Rachel's DEF CON SECTF classes, <laughs> you're going to single-handedly up the game for competitors in the coming years at the SECTF. It is exciting. Our goal, Rachel, is just to continually make sure that you never win first place <laughs> so you can keep coming back every year. And scaring us. I hope every year I get second to a man named Chris. If I can keep that up, (laughs) awesome. We can make that happen. I never have to change my talking points. (laughs) (laughs) You can just use the same slides Mm -hmm. over and over. Exactly. Listen, this year you were right up there and then Chris got in the booth. It's that one flag that is uh, get people to go to that URL. And what I really really enjoyed about your method, Chris, because at first, Michelle and I were like, okay, what's this guy doing? You had him go to an internal fake link that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And we're like, wait, we can't give him credit for that because that's just a fake link. Who cares? So we're like, no, I don't know what this guy's doing. We're not giving him credit. He's not getting points. And then you're like, well, can you get out though to Facebook? And then they go to Facebook and we're like, okay, that's still not points because that's just Facebook. But the guy went, and then you're like, okay, let's try this test site. Go to seorg.org, and then you made up this great thing. It's like systems engineering testing, whatever, <laughs> blah. You made up this wonderful thing for the acronym. And then the guy's like, I see this weird blue head security through edge. And they were like, point, there's the point. Yeah. And then you had him go to, which I thought was truly amazing, this machine.info, which then looks like the site that you were trying to get them to, because now it has all this diagnostic information, which really is nothing. But to the person on the phone, you finally accomplished your goal. So you didn't leave them feeling like, what the heck is this guy doing? I really thought that that was one of the best uses 
of go to a URL that I've ever seen in eight years of running the competition. Thank you. Yeah. And I was, I was taking a gamble on that because getting people to type in a URL is really hard. So I, I was thinking, okay, should I do this or not? And the reason I picked the internal URL first, it was my pretext was to troubleshoot something. You know, I asked him, hey, can you reach our internal backend server? So by having an internal URL, I was building rapport with the target. The next step was, you know, salami tactics. So Facebook, that would give me a flag for is Facebook blocked as a website? And then the next one was seorg.org. And then this machine.info got me the browser plus version plus operating system plus version. And I thought that was actually the fastest way to get to that information without having to click through a lot of screens. I got to say, what I loved about what you did, but every year, the person who wins generally does this same thing, whereas they take the flags and we give them to you in an order that doesn't make sense. And we do that on purpose. And then the people who win take the flags and they put them in a new order that makes more sense on the route that you ask questions. And sometimes you don't even ask the question, like what you just said, we gave you credit for that Facebook flag because you got them to go. And he said, yeah, I see Facebook. So now we know it's not blocked. So that's in essence, even though you didn't go out and ask that question directly, you got that flag. When you go to the this machine.info, you're hundred percent right. Now you have like five flags sitting right there. You have OS, you have browser, you have the SP, you have the service pack, you have the version of the browser. You, you have so much information sitting right there that got you just tons of flags without having to walk them through a lengthy click all these different things. When Chris Silvers won the year before, he did something very similar where he reorganized the flags to be in a more logical order for his pretext. And it flowed so much better that he won. Yeah, it, it reminded me a little bit way, way, way back when I took some creative writing classes. We were given certain words to weave into a story. And so this is kind of like the same thing. It's like, how the hell do you get from that word to that word? And so I first crafted the first natural flow. And then I had a spreadsheet with each pretext that told me, all right, I've done these flags already for that pretext. What's left and how can I weave that in? That's how I maximize the points for each pretext. Could you follow a similar thought process, Rachel? Yeah. I had to think about what would my target think if I asked this question outright? Because everybody wants to get that flag where you get them to go to a URL first, because it's 26 points. It's like really exciting. But you need to have some type of logical progression. So I try and get the go to a URL as early in the script as I can, while at the same time using a logical progression. Like we have on our end that systems are down. I'm not able to go to X, Y, or Z. Is it working on your end? Oh, weird. Are you able to go to this test site? I think that's a more of a logical progression than, than starting with some other things. And Chris, uh, in your second call, because you made one call and it went so well, you accomplished almost every flag. Then you hung up and you only had like six or seven minutes left. So you knew you couldn't do the same thing. So your second call, you basically went right for the get you to a URL. Actually, I followed the same script. But I had designed the script so that the 26-point question was quite early on. And I tried to drive towards that. That seemed to help you win. I think so. Yeah. It's a risky bet, I got to say, on your part, because the reason it's the biggest point flag is because it's the hardest to get people to comply with. The fact that you did it early on and you got it on two calls twice in a row. I mean, just phenomenal. Yeah, it was a risk. And I'm normally not much of a risk taker, (laughs) which sounds odd. (laughs) But yeah, I just thought it flowed well in that pretext. And my other pretexts, I had that flag later because it just didn't fit in earlier. But with this one, I was comfortable with that. Yeah. And what was amazing, you only made two calls, didn't you? I made only two calls. Yeah. Yeah. And both of them were in. That's also an interesting statistic. In in the previous years, many times the people who won end up making less calls overall than the people who score lower. That's because you're so slow at dialing, Chris. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay, hang on. Let's back up. Okay. Although you were OCD and you were very organized, you had this ridiculous, like, ancient Assyrian codex that I had to decipher (laughs) in order to figure out your list. So column three, B4, to column A, six, two. why are you making fun of this? What it is is he got a system that works for him that you don't understand and you're giving him a hard time. <laughs> ping, ping, let me explain. I have to dial every call. It has to origin it has to originate from from my computer outside the booth. Right. So one of their jobs is to give me a list of phone numbers that I call and list of spoof numbers. Right. So he developed 
a spoof number list column next to a call number list column next to some other number. And it was like, okay, spoof number 64B and call <laughs> number 32F. <laughs> Actually, Chris, I think that was a different caller. I, I gave you... Oh, it wasn't you? Yeah. I'm making oh. fun of you for nothing. <laughs> <was> still fun. <laughs> no, I did, I, did the, uh, I did the code names for each combination. So I had, you know, brush my hair 100 kind of thing. Oh, man, yours was super easy. <laughs> oh, don't you oh, no. Me now. Don't you just oh, feel bad. No, I, I do. Oh, I do. <laughs> I feel... You should really... be falling under a rock. Why are you not taking a call? I'm <laughs> under my desk. I'm under my desk. I'm so sorry, Master Kirsch. I'm so sorry, Lord. You're, you're please, forgiven. Please, you're please forgiven. forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. I, I apologize. See, I he's apologize. so comforting. Master Kirsch is so comforting because he automatically forgives you. If it were me, I would be slowly pulling your guts out. I know. You would make me eat them. Milliliter. She would be stir-frying them in some sesame oil and making me eat them. Oh, you're right. You had the funny nicknames, the Brush My Hair 100. That was quite easy. <laughs> yeah, well, you are right. It is a slow process. I, I got to figure out if there's any way to do that faster. But the problem is spoofing is done on the back end of our homemade vishing server, you know, the calls are done on a SIP client. You got to get into the to the back end browser, put the spoofing up in, number in, and then get the number that you want called entered into the SIP client. So there's always this like 60 second problem that does I, eat I up don't time. think it's actually 60 seconds. It feels like a long time when you're sitting in the booth, but when I actually checked my watch, it was actually pretty short. So yeah, but it's like, still at the it's same like time. 35. Yeah, but it feels like forever. It feels like forever for me too, because I'm like rushing and I'm trying to get it paste and copy, and then the, it automatically logs me out after like 90 seconds. I have to log back into the site, and we're trying not to do the save your password because you know you're at DefCon. So <laughs> you know, I'm like, crap! I got to keep entering this like 28 character password and every time. Why don't time. you have 2FA on there? Oh, it's it's a uh, 28 characters. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you are ridiculous, Rachel. You are ridiculous. You sure you're not a social engineer from a previous life or something? I probably was. 2FA would make it even longer. Well, no, because you could biometric it because it would be a, you can do a numerical or a pattern code and then your fingerprint. Why does it have to be a long codex of numbers? You can secure it by- On my laptop? A, a fingerprint? How am I going to do that? There are dongles for this. And we can just steal his fingers. <laughs> we cut off his hand. Yeah, <laughs> like this got very dark, very <laughs> fast. It got very dark, very fast. You and uh, Ping right, should right, right. Let, let us focus back onto our guest. Rachel and Ping should never, never be able to speak again <laughs> to, to each wait. other. You guys are scared. I'll call you in five. <laughs> <laughs> We're huddling already. Yes. Okay, so we are actually approaching the time where we have to start rapping. But Rachel and I haven't sung our Hornsby duet yet. No, no, there is no Hornsby duet. You notice Dave's not here. Okay, okay. There can't we'll, we'll be a Hornsby duet. Then. Yeah. Thank God. We'll save it for the next You know, Michelle actually has killed guests before. From a before distance with that, the power of my mind. <laughs> yeah, you know, Hornsby brings great rage inside of us. So you don't want to bring great rage inside of Michelle. It's a very scary thing. So does she become like at the end of Rogue One, which it shows Vader coming to, you know, get Princess Leia and like, Everybody's like flying to the <laughs> side and just dying with the wave That's of her Michelle. hand. That's yes, Michelle. Yes, it is. It is. It's the Michelle I know and love. I find your lack of faith disturbing. So, Rachel. Yeah. People want to know more about you. Where can they go to find out more? Twitter is the best place on the planet. So just at Rachel Toback. R-A-C-H-E-L-T-O-B-A-C. And you know what? If you want to get real professional with it, you can add me on LinkedIn. But I think Twitter is pretty good. You're really responsive on Twitter. I'm like too responsive on Twitter. Yeah. like, And it's like any time of the day or night. Like I've actually DM'd you. And like You know, at weird, yeah, odd times. And you're like within 15 seconds. What do you mean? What? Do you, what, what just turn around. I'll talk to you. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm in your closet. I'm right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very, very, very true. Um, Chris. What about you? If people want to follow you? Yeah, same thing. So Twitter is uh, at Chris underscore Kirsch. And on LinkedIn, I'm as Christian Kirsch. So Christian Kirsch. Um, yeah, those are probably the best. 
And just so we, because people will ask, your last name is K-I-R-S-C-H. That's right. Yeah, I should have spelled that out. That's okay. I just want to make sure because people will, will, I mean, they misspell names all the time. So, yeah, I, I usually get called Haganaggy <laughs> or something like that. And what's your mother's maiden name in your date of birth and social security number? Oh, uh, Smith. And I was born 1-1 one, one of 84. Oh, so you <laughs> and, really are having a quarter-life crisis. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, because I, I, I look like I'm in my my 20s or whatever that would be, 30s, whatever. I don't know. Now we have a question that we ask every guest because we have a lot of people who love to read. And if you've ever been on the SEO org resource part of our page, we have an ever growing list of books. Now these books do not have to be related to the field of SE or even security, but we like to ask if you've read any books recently that you would recommend to people. And, um, Chris, do you have, and it doesn't have to be just one, it could be a couple, but, you know, let me know if you have any books that you would like to recommend. Sure. So, um, I have a couple of things I thought about, not in terms of books, but things that help me with social engineering and that I just found interesting. So the first one has been mentioned on this podcast before. It's, it's not all about me. I thought that was really cool for rapport building. Uh, then uh, micro expressions. I got really into that. And first, uh, the, the the best one out there is Paul Ekman's training, the the face basics for ninety nine bucks. Uh, I'm super cheap, so I started out with this iPhone app called Emotion Connection for ninety nine cents, and that's not bad. So if you want to just play with that a little bit and see how you like micro expressions and so on, that's a good place to start. But ultimately, I, I ended up with uh, Paul Ekman. And then uh, to train micro expressions, I kind of watch really trashy reality TV shows because they <laughs> grind people down to their bare emotions, you know, so that's really good. And then uh, one thing that's also quick and easy to access is uh, an FBI PDF on elicitation. So if you just Google FBI elicitation PDF, that's a quick two pager. That's that's pretty good. Good. And next for me are improv classes. I want to try that out and see how that helps things. Ah, so you're going to actually take some. I already signed up. That's awesome. Actually, improv classes are something we recommend to our students all the time. If you have, if you feel that, you know, you have a hard time with just starting a conversation or being the center, improv class can really help you get past all of that. That's a, that's a great, great thing to hear. I agree with that 100%. I used to perform improv and it was probably the most useful tool getting into that box. I actually believe that so much. It's not even funny. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Rachel, what about books or recommendations from you? Yeah. Um, so I like The Social Engineer's Playbook, A Practical Guide to Pretexting by Talamantes. Um, that one helped me a lot with creating my pretext and learning as I go. Uh, the Art of Deception by Mitnick, that one is just a fun read. Um, and Ghost in the Wires, of course, uh, by Mitnick as well. But podcasts have been really, really helpful. Vince in the Bay has done a really cool podcast. Um, and he talks about social engineering a lot. So if you want to check out his, I would definitely recommend that. Um, and yeah, I pr- pretty much everything else is just like blogs. Awesome. That's great. Those are great suggestions from both of you. Thank you so much for that. Really, really appreciate it. And, um, I'm terrified to see your video next year, Rachel. Um, well, we'll see what you do. I'm not sure if there's any more ideas that you can come up with that will scare us even more, but I'm sure there are. And uh, Chris, congratulations on first place. Thank you. I never expected to do that. I thought, okay, let me just get one person on the call and like for that to go well <laughs> and then <laughs> turn out a little bit better. <laughs> have you gotten the uh, the black badge yet? I have not. I, ha- I haven't gotten the black badge yet. So if there's anybody out there listening in DEF CON organization land, I am still waiting and that would be awesome. Yeah, and you'll, you'll get it and your name's in the system. So now you're in DEF CON for free for the rest of your yep. life. And with a pretty cool badge. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And, and Rachel, congratulations again on another second place win. Woohoo! Thank you. Amazing work, both of you guys. So I really, really appreciate your time here today too. I'm hoping that this will educate and encourage a lot of new folks to give their hand a a try at it next year. That's the dream. We'll see you guys later. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Another great podcast with some good guests. Dad, that was super fun. It was. They're both such such good people. So fun. I really like the positivity that they put on 
on to not only winning, but on the competition and on their experience at DEF CON. I find that to be probably one of the biggest motivators for me that they're, they're just kind of trying to help bring a, a positive message to coming to DEF CON and to competing in the SCCTF. And I especially appreciate the fact that their personalities were very different. You know, all too often people are like, oh, stereotyping, you know, a certain specific group of people. And their approach was both was very different as well. You know, it seemed like Chris was a little was more laid back in many aspects, just personality wise. And I think in his approach, because the guy spent weekends on it. And, you know, Rachel's like, go for the gold, right? <laughs> um, and it, but it shows that both were very equally successful. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. And yeah, it's a hundred percent true. They're, I love the fact that they are polar opposites and, and yet they both did amazingly well on the competition. Yeah, and that they both can do it. It, it. I think it was awesome that Chris came back for a second try. You know, the, Me too. the thing that yeah. they had in common was that they both really worked hard to prep. They, they both came in as well prepared as they could be and in, instead of sort of flying by the seat of the pants and, and, uh, it really paid off for both of them. Yeah. That's true. Be- maybe that's why um, when you say you have the professionals there, they figure I've been doing this so long, I don't need to right. prepare sure. as deeply. I think that does happen. That's why I'm really glad, Michelle, you made that point, uh, that you made that point early on, because I think that that probably is something everybody who wants to compete needs to hear. Well, it becomes really apparent when you look at the reports, you know, when, when you look at sort of the, the work that, that both of them put into their targets, they really literally did know their their targets inside and out. So it's just kind of a, a, a testament to just kind of hard work as opposed to just thinking that you're going to go in there and, and because you're a good BSer to, to pull off the contest. Yeah, I agree. And and you're right about the reports. They're, they were they were both just well written and very thorough. And, and between the both of them, I think there was over a hundred pages of report reading that we had to do for that for them. So quite quite amazing. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, next year seeing what happens, and hopefully this will answer a lot of the questions we get from from you guys listening about the SCCTF and um and uh, and competing if you'd like to join. Uh, keep in mind, we'll be uh, probably announcing the next year's DEF CON somewhere in January or February, so you don't have to email and ask. That is the time. January, February of 18 is when we'll be announcing announcing that, and then the sign-up form will be on the .org website. If you'd like to follow us, our corporate is uh, corporate Twitter is SOC Engineer Inc. I am at Human Hacker. Michelle? At Sultry Asian. Ping at Volkari B L K Y R I. I always say it wrong. I'm glad that you said it. I always say it wrong, and I always spell it wrong too. So I'm glad you need to be you... more attentive. I do, I do, and I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. But thank you, thank you for correcting it. Um, corporate website is social-engineer.com, and of course the social-engineer.org. I think that is basically every way to contact us. If you miss Dave. You can ping him on Twitter at human or at, at hacking Dave and tell him that uh, you're mad because he missed yet another podcast. And you can let him know that, that you're disappointed in that. He has failed. He has failed. Until next month when it's number 99. See ya. Stay to the Amazon the 1st of November and remember you